says, good, I don't want to be embarrassed. Tonight's commencement speeches begin at 10 Eastern time on American Perspectives. Now, access to FBI files. Wednesday, a House committee began hearings to examine how the White House obtains background files from the FBI. Officials from the Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations testified. Republican William Klinger chaired this five-hour-long hearing. The Committee on Government Reform and uh, Oversight will come to order. Uh, we are going to proceed this morning with, I will give an opening statement, Mrs. Collins will give an opening statement, uh, then other members, I would request if they have opening statements, could either submit them for the record or use the time period uh, which would be allotted to them as we proceed uh, after the witnesses to make their opening statements. Uh, we meet this morning to discuss a very troubling development that has been uncovered in the course of our investigation into the White House Travel Office matter. The scope of this morning's hearing uh, will be limited to a consideration of the procedures that have been in place for a number of years for the uh, White House request for classified information, FBI files. At a future hearing, we will consider how those procedures have been carried out by the President administration. On May 30th, 1996, several weeks after the White House ostensibly had claimed executive privilege over 3,000 pages of Travelgate documents, which it continued to hold, <clears throat> the committee received from the White House 1,000 pages of those documents. Two pages of these documents revealed a White House request for the FBI background files of former Travel Office Director Billy Ray Dale. The reason given for the request was that Mr. Dale was being considered for access to the White House. The request was made seven months after Mr. Dale had been fired by the White House and accused of criminal wrongdoing. As a result of these accusations, a 30-month Department of Justice investigation was seven months uh, in progress, had seven months along when this really highly suspect request from the White House was made. Needless to say, this request was of more than passing interest to the committee. Last week, FBI Director Free issued a report indicating that the White House sought and obtained more than 400 such FBI confidential background files, as he said, without justification, in the same time frame in late 1993 and early 1994. The FBI report notes that at the time, FBI officials noticed that and I'm quoting, unusually large numbers of requests for copies of previous reports only, uh, but when they contacted the White House Security Office to ensure that its new occupants understood the process, the FBI was assured that the White House was, quoting, simply updating their files. These files were predominantly those of Republican officials from the Bush and Reagan administrations and included prominent figures such as former Secretary of State James Baker, former Press, uh, Bush Press Secretary Marlon Fitzwater, former CIA Director William Colby, and even one of today's witnesses, uh, former Reagan White House Counsel A.B. Culvahouse. These improperly obtained files were never returned uh, to the FBI until only in the last few weeks. In his report, Director Free also noted that among the unquestionably unjustified acquisitions were reports relating to discharged travel office employees Billy Ray Dale and Barnaby Brousseau. He also noted that an additional 71 files were requested inappropriately and were only turned over to the FBI on June 13th. That was one day before the FBI report was issued. 17 other files, we understand, are still in question, still retained by the White House, uh, and uh, are still sort of in limbo as to whether they should be returned uh, to the FBI. So while we continue to try to uncover the facts and determine what led to what I think all agree was an incredible invasion of the privacy of more than 400 individuals, I'm very pleased that new procedures have been put in place, albeit belatedly. As Director Free noted in his report, the long-standing former system of providing FBI files to the White House relied on 
and in his words, the good faith and honor of those who were integrally, integrally involved in the process. This standard, apparently sufficient for more than 30 years in the absence of any reported abuse, demonstrated serious weaknesses when individuals who were incompetent individuals, or perhaps worse, were put in charge of the system at the Clinton White House. It now seems abundantly clear that the system in place was, in fact, vulnerable to misuse, and actions have now fortunately been taken to remedy those weaknesses. And I, again, applaud Director Free for making the changes swiftly and for accepting responsibility for the actions of the FBI. He could have assigned blame to lower-level file clerks or imagined computer glitches, but he did not. Director Free has described the prior system which has been used throughout both Democrat and Republican administrations and which it now appears was indeed very vulnerable to abuse. I believe the changes and new safeguards in this exchange of sensitive information will be welcomed on a bipartisan basis. As the Boston Globe noted, and I'm quoting, high officials' misuse of confidential information about their own citizens has produced some of the most shameful chapters in American history. Not all of it, unfortunately, in the past, close quote. It is important that we not only avoid repeating the mistakes of the past, but that we put procedures in place that assist in assuring that no new, abuse, no new abuses arise, and that is the function of this committee. I also welcome the changes made by the White House Counsel in procedures in conjunction with the FBI recommendations. But while new systems are welcome in this extraordinarily sensitive area, I would note no system that involves sensitive security matters can be invulnerable to incompetent or worse malicious individuals who do not have a sufficient appreciation for the seriousness of such a responsibility as handling FBI background files. The casualness with which this White House has approached many areas of security and protocol reflect, I think, a contempt for process and a disturbing lack of respect for following the rules. It seems the White House that is intent on keeping secret so many of its own documents has an unacceptably loose standard when it comes to the confidential background files of average American citizens, private citizens. Incredibly, while the White House says it acknowledges this gross error in obtaining the files of Reagan and Bush officials, the individual who oversaw this office was only paid, placed on paid administrative leave two days ago. A longtime Democratic political operative and Clinton-Gore campaign aide, Craig Livingstone, was placed in charge of personnel security from day one of the Clinton administration. His direct superior, Rose Law Firm partner, Bill Kennedy, came a month or so later to the White House uh, as the deputy counsel. Mr. Kennedy subsequently re was relieved of his duties in overseeing these matters when news of his failure to pay nanny taxes and his failure to include this information on his own background investigation was brought to light. While Mr. Kennedy and three White House counsels have come and gone, Mr. Livingstone remained in this intensely sensitive position until this past Monday, June 17th. And the one has to ask the question, why? Was this really the best individual that the White House could find for this extremely sensitive position? And isn't it troubling that Mr. Livingstone sought out another seasoned political operative to be detailed to the White House, and it is this 50-something-year-old man who initially was described by the White House as a low-level clerk, uh, apolitical individual, uh, bureaucrat, who fouled up these sensitive procedures. The reason we have background files in the first place is it's so that it is possible to access the suitability of those in sensitive positions. It is ironic that while the White House wants us to accept its defense of gross incompetence as the reason for obtaining these files, it was willing to retain an individual at the center of the incompetence until the mounting furor forced its hand and it hoped that we would ignore the fact that the low-level clerk was in fact an experienced investigator with democratic political credentials going back many years. It's important to note at the outset that we never would have learned of what Director Free correctly called egregious violations of privacy, if not for the contempt vote in this committee over a month ago in trying to obtain White House compliance with our bipartisan subpoenas. The documents which revealed this travesty were among the 1,000 pages of travel to gate documents that the White House had withheld for months. The White House never disclosed to the committee that it was withholding Billy Dale's FBI background file 
which the White House sought and obtained over seven months after he was fired. Instead, the White House said it had personnel files on Mr. Dale, which are an entirely different item and were in fact separately provided to the committee. It was only on the morning of the contempt vote that these documents were turned over. I have to say that this kind of evasiveness does not inspire the confidence that allows us to complete this investigation and on the contrary raises our level of skepticism about the various reasons and, and uh, excuses that have been offered with regard to this whole matter. The White House and the involved individuals have offered numerous excuses for what even Chief of Staff Leon Panetta has acknowledged was an inexcusable mistake. As the New York Times has noted, President Clinton's staff has a talent for forcing people to choose between incompetence and skullduggery as an excuse for their managerial snafus, close quote. We are still deposing witnesses, that, uh, the committee is still deposing witnesses and gathering the documents we think are necessary to find out the facts behind this unprecedented, unauthorized, and inappropriate gathering of confidential FBI background files. Whether this was part of a larger pattern of trying to compromise the FBI or part of the all too familiar pattern of incompetence and incredibly mismanaged record keeping at the White House will be the subject of further investigation and further hearings, which we will be announcing very shortly. I want to welcome our guests to the, to the hearing this morning, look forward to their testimony as they tell us what went on during their watch and uh, how these procedures were conducted at that time. And I'm now pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member of the committee, Mrs. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding hearings on the subject of the improper use of FBI files, and I want to be very clear at the outset that we have no disagreement on one important issue. It was wrong to request the files of former administration officials, and it was wrong for the FBI to provide that information. I cannot emphasize enough my concern when the private files of any American are put in the wrong hands. I strongly believe that the right to privacy is one of the most important rights of our Constitution. When privacy rights are abused in connection with the potential for political misuse, my concerns are compounded. Therefore, I welcome these hearings for two important reasons. First, if properly conducted, they can determine what actually happened in this particular case and, separa and separate fact from fiction or speculation. Second they can provide the necessary insight to ensure that this problem is not repeated in the future. We have relatively few facts at this moment, but a high dose of speculation. The principal fact, and it's a big one, is that a large number of summary background files from the FBI relating to employees of the previous administration were improperly requested by the White House and improperly provided by the FBI. What we don't know is exactly why the files were requested who reviewed their contents, and to whom the information contained in those files was disseminated. We have also learned another startling fact. Under the procedures utilized by this administration, as well as previous administrations dating back 30 years, it was easier to order FBI files than it was to order a box of paper clips. Apparently, all that was required was a simple request form, which has not been significantly changed um, since the Johnson administration with the name of a White House counsel typed at the top. No signature was required. No explanation of the need for the information was required. Thus, there was absolutely no accountability. Now, this procedure must end. The FBI and the White House are both making changes in this system, and this committee should take a long, hard look at the changes to determine whether they go far enough. The evidence to date also raises serious questions about the placement of individuals with campaign background in important positions in the Office of Personnel Security. Now, I would expect that the committee is going to look into measures to ensure that in the future such employees are career civil servants rather than political appointees. This committee must examine both how this improper use of, this fi of these files occurred and why it occurred. But regardless of the reason for these files being requested by the White House, it was wrong. But there is a significant distinction between requests being made for a sinister political use and requests being made due to a mistake. Now, I'm certain that all of my colleagues here today understand the seriousness, seriousness of this distinction. 
We have to therefore explore the circumstances leading up to the request for the files, as well as their subsequent use to determine just how serious this problem was. Now I would urge all of my colleagues to consider their statements very carefully today. It's important that we stick to the facts and not rumor and not speculation. For example, I've heard various comments, uh, comments about this case alleging that the files were requested to get the dirt on the fire travel office employees. Others have speculated that the White House counsel or even the First Lady were behind some sort of campaign to embarrass former employees. However, I am unaware that the committee has the facts to prove such allegations. The White House has characterized the episode as a bureaucratic snafu. Only further investigation will determine whether that is correct. So similarly, I will not represent that theory as a matter of fact. In short, speculation may make good partisan headlines, but it will do very little to enhance the credibility of our committee's investigation. One of the witnesses today may begin to shed light on how the White House came into possession of the wrong FBI files. Ms. Nancy Gemmell came to the White House in the Nixon administration and served in the Personnel Security Office in the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations. She is reported to have helped train the employees of the Personnel Security Office on the so-called Update Project to reconstruct the files of holdover employee uh, personnel with White House passes. She is perhaps the only person testifying today who will have first-hand knowledge of this matter and can begin the process of uncovering what took place. So I urge you, Mr. Chairman, to proceed as quickly as possible to get to the bottom of this issue. We need to bring in those actually responsible, including Craig Livingstone, Anthony Marsesa, Lisa Wetzel, and any others in the Office of Personnel Security to publicly testify on exactly what occurred. Mr. Livingstone and Ms. Wetzel have already testified in depositions to this committee, and their testimony is very important. For example, Ms. Wetzel appears to be the individual who, after um, um, Anthony Marsesa left, uncovered the fact that he had wrongly requested the files of individuals no longer employed there. She apparently also discovered outdated Secret Service lists that may have formed the basis for the request. I believe that this committee should put all of the facts on the table. At the last hearing, it was my understanding that you, Mr. Chairman, had placed all the depositions the committee had taken on the travel office matter on the public record. My view was shared by the parliamentarian's office who reviewed the transcript. However, you subsequently contended that you had placed just four transcripts on the record with no explanation whatever of how those four were chosen. I repeat that all of the depositions should be placed on the record, including, for example, those of Craig Livingstone, Anthony Marsesa, and Lisa Wetzel. There is no reason for the committee to be engaging for the committee to be engaged in any secrecy or cover-up. The deposition authority was requested because, as you, Mr. Chairman, stated on the House floor, and I'm quoting now, it would be extremely impractical to expect this committee to hold enough hearings to place all the necessary witnesses under oath publicly, end quote. In other words, the purpose of the deposition authority was to provide a practical substitute for public hearings, not to convert public testimony into secret testimony. We're not a grand jury. We are a public institution, and our rules require us to hold public hearings. The Democrats on this committee have supported your efforts to require the administration to provide all of the information we need, Mr. Chairman. Similarly, we support total disclosure by this committee, and I therefore ask unanimous consent that all transcripts of all depositions be placed at this point in the record and yield back the balance of my time. Uh, is there object? Well, I object to the uh, releasing of all the depositions at this point, and the reason for that is that we are still in the process of taking depositions which we do not want to prejudice uh, the future depositions that may be taken. I can assure the gentlelady that we have every intention of making all of the depositions that we have uh, taken thus far a part of the public record. Mr. Chairman, and we'll may do I so ask when you plan to do that? As soon as we have completed uh, the, uh, the deposition process, which should be within the next uh, two to three weeks. Uh, and now I'm prepared to uh, ask the, uh, the witnesses for this hearing to come forward and let me introduce them as they come. Uh, the first uh, witness is Mr. Boyden Gray, who is the former White House counsel to President George Bush. Next, Mr. Dick Hauser, 
former White House deputy counsel to uh, counsel Fred Fielding under President Ronald Reagan, Mr. A.B. Culverhouse, who was the former White House counsel to President uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Ms. Uh, Jane Dannenhauer, a former White House assistant to the counsel to the president in the Office of Personnel Security under Presidents Nixon, Ford, uh, for two and a half months, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and for one month, President Clinton, so has served under, uh, under uh, many of the preceding presidents. And finally, uh, Ms. Nancy Gemmell, assistant to the Office of Personnel Security under Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. Uh, let the record note that we did invite Mr. Marco Car Michael Cardoza, who was the deputy White House counsel during President Carter's administration, who was unable to attend or who declined to attend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is the practice of this committee to swear all witnesses so that we do not prejudice the rights or of any witness. And if you have no objection, may I ask you to rise and uh, we will swear you. I swear the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record note that all of the witnesses uh, nodded or answered in the affirmative. Uh, and I will ask uh, you, Mr. Gray, welcome to the committee. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, uh, you have my prepared statement, so I will try to be as brief as possible uh, to summarize, to try to provide you a basic framework for understanding uh, what information we tried to uh, we did get from the FBI and then um, how we used it. I, of course, can only speak for uh, the Bush administration, but we tried to follow the procedures developed in previous administrations. Uh, anything I did right, uh, I owe to my predecessor, A.B. Anything I did wrong uh, was, was, uh, was our fault. Uh, there were uh, three categories of information that we sought from the FBI, and I divided into three in order to try to make it um, understandable because there was an enormous amount of paper uh, flow involved and it was a complex process. The first category uh, uh, involved requests for name check checks from the FBI. That is a, a run through of their computer base to see if there were any uh, recent um, uh, uh, potentially illegal activity on the public record um, so that we had an early warning signal as to whether or not we had a difficult problem on our hands. We had these name checks run to build, uh, when we came into a new administration, to build um, a temporary access list uh, for people who were awaiting the full field investigations, the full investigations that would give them permanent clearance uh, to the White House or to a cabinet uh, level post. You might want to think of this first category as a, as a waiting list. Uh, these were, again, people who were awaiting full investigation. Um, but we had to do a brief check to make sure that they could be let into the complex for a temporary uh, period. Usually that uh, list was um, supposed to provide for access only for 90 days. Now the second uh, category was uh, the request for a full field investigation uh, by the FBI in connection with um, new appointees, White House staff, uh, cabinet. Of course, in some cases, um, appointees would have served in previous administrations and so the full field investigation would, would consist of, a, of, a, uh, of an update since their last um, investigation. Um, in, in each of these cases, the individual would, would be required to fill out, before the uh, full field investigation could begin, a very lengthy form called Form 86. Very, very comprehensive. Uh, many, many fill out. Um, this would be done before um, the FBI would start its um, agents into the field. And of course, by the very nature of everything, uh, an individual who had filled out this form knew pretty well uh, what he or she was, uh, was in for. The final category is one that has uh, received attention in the press recently, um, was the updates of the semi-permanent White, uh, White House staff, the people who served uh, president after president after president. Uh, this was not the highest priority because these were people already there who had already been cleared. But when the back was broken, as it were, of the clearance for the new people you wanted to get in, um, you would, we would recreate, we did recreate by asking for the FBI to give us copies of the files of uh, current White House employees who were holdovers or who continued in their posts from administration to administration. In due course, you know, these files would have to be updated 
um, uh, on a rotating four-year basis depending on when the individual's last uh, clearance check uh, had been run. Uh, the request would go to the FBI on an office-by-office -office basis. Um, uh, when uh, the, uh, the time came for an update, of course, the update uh, would be requested of the FBI on a chronological basis depending on when uh, the four years was um, about to be over. I want to note here that uh, what this meant for us in any event was that a, an old, if you will, dead file of someone uh, not actually working in the White House um, without uh, an old, uh, requesting an old dead file without uh, some update information, that is by, by way of a name check at the FBI or a fuller FBI investigation, uh, served no, no purpose. It would have been of no value, would have, would have, would have led to, to no other action. Now, what, what did we do with all this information? How did we obtain it, and, and what did we do with it? Um, the paper flow was managed uh, in, our, in our days by an extraordinary individual named Jane Dannenhauer, who was sitting up here, uh, who uh, had an, 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 an unenviable task of managing what some people uh, who used to ferry documents around the White House used to say uh, was enormous. Um, one of our messengers said that the paper flow into the council's office was 10 times the paper flow for all the West of the White House combined. Staff, not talking about the president. Um, so it was a huge task. Um, Jane Dannenhauer was an assistant to the, to the president, and the office uh, operated under um, my supervision, under AB supervision, under Dick's supervision, Fred Feeling, um, uh, who was uh, counsel in the first Reagan uh, term. Um, the, the paperwork, as I say, was very tricky. Many of you will still have difficulty, I'm sure, a week from now, two weeks from now, understanding exactly all the details. And frankly, there are times when I wonder if I still understand all the details. You will have to ask Jane if you, if you uh, uh, can confound us, which you may well be able to do, as to actually how the paper was conducted. But I want to make very, very clear that as professional and as dedicated and as good-humored as Jane was, she did not make um, uh, substantive judgments on this material. That was reserved virtually exclusively to the White House counsel, myself, and my deputy, who was John Schmitz in the Bush administration. Um, if there was, she would read the files, uh, and if there was anything remotely questionable, the file would shoot straight up into my office, where it would be read only by John Schmitz, and if he felt he couldn't make a decision based on guidelines developed uh, by myself and him with the President and Chief of Staff, if he felt he could not make a decision based on those principles, he would kick it to me uh, for further discussion, perhaps with the President or the Chief of Staff. Uh, I would guess that John Schmitz must have read hundreds, maybe a thousand of these. Uh, I myself probably read about a hundred. I never got used to it. Uh, I had, the, I had the, a very uncomfortable feeling every time I was forced to read one. You're peering into uh, someone's life, seeing things that nobody has any right going. But it was a, a necessary um, a task uh, which we felt we had to do uh, in order to pr protect uh, the country in, in, in connection with security, potential security breaches, and of course to protect um, the, the President uh, politically. Doing this work, really thank this work of reading these, this unpleasant work of reading these files was a central obligation of the Council's office um, I felt I never got out of it for the entire first year to do anything that I considered um, more personally uh, rewarding or, or fun. It was a very, very difficult task. People will say, well, gee whiz, you um, and your deputy were political, are political, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, certainly we're political in the largest sense of the word, but we were reviewing files of our own people, not files of the, the Carter administration or, the, say, the Clinton administration. Um, I, think, I hope I've given you an outline of how we of what information we obtain and generally how we obtained it, and I will um, stop there and let the others pick up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gray. And now we'll go to Mr. Hauser, I believe. Is that... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'm pleased to be for you today to address the important issue of the White House handling of FBI files. Uh, I have a written statement which I've submitted, and I'm going to just touch on some of the elements uh, of my uh, statement. And I hope that my experiences uh, uh, during the Reagan administration will be helpful to the, to the committee. 
Uh, I had the honor of serving as deputy counsel to President Reagan from uh, early in 1981 until mid-1986 when I left for the um, private practice of law. Uh, as deputy counsel, uh, I was involved in the clearance process for presidential appointees uh, and the White House staff. Uh, at some point in, in 1981, I assumed a greater responsibility for this from uh, Mr. Fueling, uh, eventually assuming almost exclusive responsibility. Uh, I would, however, continue to share and discuss with Mr. Fielding background reports, uh, raise questions that required his judgment because of the issue, position, or the individual involved. Uh, background reports, uh, uh, for the reasons that Mr. Gray was describing, were treated with great respect, great respect and access was, was restricted to the Council's office. Uh, to my knowledge, and I've discussed this with Mr. Fielding, uh, background files were never shown to others in the White House, including the President, the Vice President, the Chief of Staff, or the Director of Presidential Personnel. It was understood and accepted that it was the Council's job whether clearance should be approved, and this decision would have been made by Mr. Fielding or me. Uh, certainly, there were a small number of instances in which aspects of background reports would have been discussed with some of the individuals I've, me I've mentioned, but it was on a need-to-know basis, and it was without sharing the file. In addition to the appointment process and staffing of the White House, which was a continuing process throughout the administration, the files of White House staff, career or appointed, would have been updated on a routine basis, usually every four years. These, too, would have been reviewed by me if they contained any derogatory information. And access to the files was similarly limited. I do not recall any instance in which the report of an official from a prior administration was requested unless it was in connection with an appointment by President Reagan. Restricting access to information contained in the FBI background reports was intended to serve two important purposes. One, assuring the privacy of the prospective appointee or staff member, and two, maintaining the integrity of the background investigation process. These issues uh, have larger public policy implications. And uh, I, I mention these because I have heard that it's sort of like no harm, no foul. People haven't used these, therefore there is no harm uh, to the individual or to, uh, to the larger public interest. Uh, but I'd like to point out that there is, there is already a significant loss of privacy imposed on individuals entering public service, and the careless treatment of privacy protections will surely be a deterrent for some considering public service. When called, some will stand aside. I am personally aware of highly qualified individuals who refuse the call to serve fearing loss of privacy. And this response is likely to be reinforced by a breakdown in the handling of FBI files, whether by this administration or future administrations. And the ramification for the staffing of future administrations is serious. <clears throat> in addition, a background report is designed to produce complete and accurate information on the character, associates, reputation, and loyalty of the subject of the background check. Understandably, when interviewed by the FBI, friends, associates, co-workers, and neighbors of the subject are often reluctant to be candid, particularly if they are aware of derogatory information for fear that it may be leaked or improperly circulated. As a, consequences, as a consequence, these sources may sugarcoat important information or seek anonymity for fear of attribution, thus diluting the quality and usefulness of the background report. I think we can all recall instances where issues relating to suitability were not adequately surfaced during a background investigation. This problem is likely to be compounded in the future, and I know that this is a concern shared by the FBI. Also, the careless or casual handling of matters so sensitive and personal as background investigations erodes the confidence of citizens, not only in the integrity of the decision-making process, but in government generally, and once this trust is lost, it is hard to regain. I would like to uh, briefly uh, comment about the Special Inquiry Unit of the FBI. Uh, I had the privilege of working with several chiefs of that unit uh, who were dedicated, hardworking, and responsive. Uh, we worked cooperatively to improve and expedite the background investigation process, and any problems encountered would be discussed uh, and resolved. I think I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman. I hope these comments are helpful, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hauser. And now we'll hear from Mr. Culvehouse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also have submitted a written statement for the record. Uh, many of the uh, points covered therein have been covered uh, by my uh, predecessors and colleagues, and I'll just briefly summarize a few points. 
I had the, uh, the privilege of serving as uh, President Ronald Reagan's White House counsel for 22 months, uh, beginning in March 1987. I was recommended to the President by Senator Howard Baker, who was then the new uh, White House Chief of Staff. I had the honor of serving as Senator Baker's Chief Legislative Assistant for three years uh, during, uh, uh, really, my first assignment was to, uh, to sit behind Senator Baker during the Senate Watergate Committee hearings as he uh, uh, posed that famous question to John Dean. Uh, Senator Baker and I, when we uh, came to the White House, had uh, uh, negotiated with uh, President Reagan uh, because uh, of the pressure that the White House was under to deal with the Iran-Contra investigations, uh, the authority to uh, revamp the White House staff uh, really to our liking with some exceptions. Interestingly enough, Mr. Chairman, in terms of the inquiry of this committee, I remember the two of us sitting down with Marlon Fitzwater, uh, who described the press operation, the strengths and weaknesses thereof. And as, Mar as Marlon was leaving, Marlon said, and oh, by the way, there is this uh, office in the White House called the Travel Office. Uh, most of uh, the, the, the political White House staff believe it to be populated by uh, people appointed by President Johnson, but please don't fire them because if you do, uh, the White House press will make my life uh, forever difficult. So uh, we, uh, we took uh, Marlin's advice. Uh, the sa we got the same reports when I uh, looked at counsel's office staff. Uh, it was a system that, uh, it was a group of people that, uh, that worked well, that were hugely respected. And I think the two people that, uh, that received the highest marks, uh, not only from the, the, their fellow White House staff members, uh, but from the Secret Service, the FBI, and the many people with whom we worked, were my uh, deputy Jay Stevens and Jane Denenauer. Uh, they, uh, they, they ran a professional operation that was, uh, it wasn't broke, it didn't need to be fixed, and uh, I was encouraged not to make, make any changes. I did not, and I'm glad I didn't. Uh, I think that the culture and the procedures that were developed are a tribute not only to my predecessors, to uh, Fred Fielding, Dick Hauser, and Peter Wallison, but frankly to people like Lloyd Cutler and uh, Michael Cardozo in the Carter administration. As the FBI report uh, points out, many of these procedures date back to 30 years. That is not to say they couldn't be improved. It's not to say that we, haven't, uh, we shouldn't learn lessons from what has gone, gone awry. But I think the culture of professionalism, of confidentiality, of, uh, of uh, care and attention to detail is something that's grown up over the years and, and it's not attributable to one president or to two presidents, but to several presidents and several uh, White House counsel. Uh, reviewing FBI files is a solemn legal and ethical obligation. I share with Boyd and Gray uh, my distaste. It was the least attractive feature of my job. I did not want to know that much about my colleagues or about other senior governmental officials. If you think, if you look at the question, the standard form 86, it is designed to affirmatively encourage the furnishing of adverse information, of derogatory information. It asks, have you ever had counseling for drug, alcohol abuse, or mental health counseling? It asks, have you ever been arrested other than a minor traffic offense? It asked, have you used drugs in the last 18 years? Have you ever, have, have, have you ever a problem with alcohol? Have you failed to pay taxes? And then there's the catch-all at the end. And please tell us anything else that might be embarrassing to you, your family, or the president. And that's not asked only of you, uh, the person going through clearance, but it's asked of your friends, your neighbors, and people who may not be your friends. And uh, then you also have the FBI uh, uh, name check. The, it goes to the SEC. There are people with the same names. So in my experience, almost every, I can't say this, the significant number, perhaps the majority of FBI files I saw had some derogatory information, often wrong, often uncooperated, often unfair. Uh, but it had some negative information and it's information that deserves to be treated with the utmost uh, confidentiality, but at the same time, it's necessary. The, we, we collected this information for two reasons, really. One, what I would call the security reason for White House pass holders, the people like me, all of us at this table, who every day were in close proximity to the president, to the vice president, to foreign leaders, to senior governmental officials, the Secret Service, the FBI, and counsel's office all had a vested interest in making sure people in close proximity, whether they were the White House Chief of Staff or a groundskeeper, did not pose a security risk to the President, to the Vice President, to foreign leaders. The second reason was, the good, was, was uh, upholding the President's constitutional responsibility 
to nominate uh, officers of the executive branch, uh, com uh, pe people appointed to commissions, and people appointed to the federal judiciary. And the FBI files were a fundamentally important part of us determining that these people were suitable to hold those positions and to so represent to the United States Senate uh, for those who had to be confirmed. So it is a necessary process, and it's a process that, uh, that I, I think uh, in general has worked well but, but, but you cannot minimize the importance of, uh, of uh, protecting the confidentiality of the information for the reasons that Dick Hauser uh, explained. If people are concerned, whether it's the individual filling out the forms or the neighbors or the friends or the, or the, or the teachers are concerned that the information is going to be disseminated widely, treated cavalierly, uh, used for political or other illicit purposes, then you're going to get information that's not candid, that's not forthcoming, or, you, or you're going to get just false information. And that's not good for the White House, it's not good for the government, it's not good for the Senate confirmation process, and that's what uh, deserves to be protected. Finally, I've read with, uh, with interest the recommendations of the FBI uh, in its report. Uh, I think in the main uh, uh, they are good and general la generally laudatory. Uh, they. Uh, any system that's been in existence, as the FBI points out and the chairman points out in his remarks for 30 years, uh, can probably span some improvements and tweaking. Uh, it, it will result in additional paperwork. I don't think it would have changed our internal procedures very much. Certainly with respect to uh, pivoting people into clearance, putting and, and, and dealing with senior White House positions, those people were not uh, name checks, uh, FBI files, were not requested except with the uh, senior authority of the counsel's office. It would have involved, it would involve, have involved more senior law, lawyer involvement in lower level positions in the White House, people who were not going to be Senate confirmed, who were not presidential appointees, or, or who were not going to get a commission uh, from the president. And uh, that, uh, that's probably okay. That's going to result in some additional workload on counsel's office. But I'd rather have a system that's maybe, oh, maybe uh, overly protective of information than, uh, than uh, see uh, what appears to have happened in this case. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Cole, the House. Uh, and now I'm pleased to call upon uh, Ms. Jane Danauer. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Jane Danauer. I retired in March 1993 from the... A little closer. Sir. I departed the White House staff on March 1, 1993. Until January 20th of that year, I held the position of assistant to the council to the president with the responsibility of directing the White House security office under the council. Our security office with a staff of five was, re uh, was responsible for providing through Secret Service clearance into the White House complex, all White House personnel and all other permanent staff of support offices, such as records management, correspondence, communications, telephone operators, and other offices that continue operation from administration to administration. At the beginning of the new administration, the major thrust, obviously, is to clear all new White House personnel. They, along with the prospective presidential appointees, have the very highest priority in our clearance process. Prior to January 20, 1981, the focus was to provide the names of the new staff members to Secret Service along with the FBI check information to allow admittance to the complex on the appointed day. After January 20, and for several months thereafter, the White House Security Office was consumed with the collection of standard Form 86 completed and signed from the proposed presidential appointees and new White House staff members for the FBI to complete the background of investigations as expeditiously as possible. Later in the first year of the new administration, as time permitted, we started the process of restructuring the files on support personnel. Although this project was not a priority, it was necessary to have the prior FBI uh, reports of these current employees in order to implement the policy of updating background investigations on a four-year cycle. That was the policy at the time. The reason this project was not a top priority was the fact that these employees had completed background investigations and held permanent passes. In this connection, we requested and received from the FBI copies of these previous reports. These reports were placed in our vault 
and the dates of completion recorded in a log to determine when to begin the four-year update in each case. Each previous report received from the FBI was reviewed by me and sent to the de deputy counsel and counsel if an earlier update might be indicated. In this manner, counsel was aware of any possible problems with the existing personnel as well as with new personnel. This update process continued throughout each administration of which I was a part and included only those employees currently working at the White House. During the years I was responsible for the security office, I was very fortunate to have dedicated and loyal staffs who were honored to serve the presidency. There were no detailees from other agencies in the security office or volunteers without a full background investigation. In the Reagan and Bush administrations, my assistant was Nancy Gemmel, who worked with me for 12 years. And she, as well as our other three assistants, were detail-oriented and meticulous with the handling and storage of these very private files. They and the staffs of previous years were well aware of the sensitivity of the files and the extreme caution needed to protect them. I was privileged to serve in four administrations starting in October 1972 with the Nixon administration. I was employed by the Ford, Reagan, and Bush administrations in the same capacity. Also at the request of Mr. Robert Lipschutz, counsel to President Carter, I and one of my assistants at the time remained it for two and a half months to train the new staff member and await a new director. By so doing, such assistance ensured a smooth transition. I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Dan Auer. Uh, Ms. Gebel. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Gemmel. I began my government career at the Department of the Treasury in 1968. Yeah, I think you can get a little closer to the mic. All right. Yeah. Should I start over? If you would. All right. I began my government service in 1968 at the Department of the Treasury. In 1969, I began my White House service. I was privileged to have served in the Special Projects Office, for many years to have worked in the President's Appointments and Scheduling Office, and also in 1981 until my retirement on August 13 of 1993 in the White House Security Office. My government service began during the Johnson Administration, spanning the Nixon Administration, the Ford Administration, the Carter Administration, two terms of the Reagan Administration, the Bush Administration, and again until August 13 of 1993, the Clinton Administration. It has been my honor to have served these administrations, and I will be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank all of the panel for uh, your very helpful testimony. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule, and uh, I will uh, lead off with the first series of questions, if, if I may. I'm going to flip the... To me, to, and this is sort of addressed to the panel generally, but certainly to me, one of the real problems here is who is in charge of this office? Who is put in charge of this office? Uh, and there was apparently, in this case, political operatives were in charge of the office. So I would ask you, uh, Mr. Gray, Mr. Kohlhaus, Mr. Hauser, uh, give us your sense of what the qualifications should be for a person that would be in charge of this office. What kind of background would be, in your view, uh, essential to, uh, to be the administrator of this office? Someone uh, with um, great uh, precision, attention to detail, uh, management skills, uh, great patience, uh, great, great discretion. Um, one, one could say if you did a description of Jane Dannenhauer, you would have a good profile of the kind of person um, you wanted. Now, of course, she's not, I'm sure, unique, but um, she did a, a, a fantastic job for us. It is exceedingly difficult to manage this mountain of paper without letting any of it leak out, um, and, and at the same time not having, if you will, the fun of being able to act substantively on the material that you are, um, are managing. The, um, the decisions based on the, on the process that she so well managed or such a person would manage rests with the White House counsel. 
Uh, now, one of the uh, elements that was raised in the FBI report by Mr. Free was that the system that had been in place for 30 years, literally for instance, since uh, Lyndon Johnson's time, had worked pretty well. It relied upon the initial uh, thing that, that uh, prompted the return of an FBI file to the White House was a form uh, sent out over the name of the White House counsel. But he also indicated that the system really relied upon the honor and integrity of the people making those requests. In your experience, who should have the authority? Uh, Mr. Nussbaum didn't apparently know who was doing this in his name. Uh, he disclaimed any knowledge of, of these forms being sent out. Doesn't there need to be somebody who is aware of uh, who is requesting these forms and under what criteria these forms are being requested? Well, let, let me see if I can answer this, and, and, and Dick ought to, because A.B., I think, was not there at the beginning of an administration, which, which uh, may make his situation slightly different. But if you, if you look at it from the very, very beginning, nothing would get triggered. Nothing would get triggered unless the subject of, of an inquiry would have filled out various forms and thereby consented to the process. In our case, White House personnel would come to me with, all right, this is who we want to put in the clearance for X, Y, or G job, and then we would kick it downstairs, and then the process would unfold. Um, the, only, the only time, I think, generally speaking, uh, where uh, something would get initiated without my uh, having triggered it in, so, in, in some fashion was with uh, basically the permanent White House staff or replacement for secretaries, people who weren't senior White House staff. There, um, of course, the permanent White House staff are, have already been cleared, know that they undergo updates every uh, four years, and would be on notice that once an old administration went out taking their files with them, that they had every reason to expect that the files would be restored uh, once the new administration got its act in, in, in place. Mr. Culverhouse or Mr. Hauser, either one. Uh, my, my experience is the same as that of Mr. Gray's, that uh, at, the, at the beginning of an administration, it's really through uh, the processes initiated through the Form 86, waivers are obtained from individuals. Uh, these are people who are applying for jobs, understand that a background investigation will be done uh, as part of the clearance process and the issuance of a pass. So there's, there's nothing mysterious uh, about that, and their, their consent is, uh, is obtained. Mr. Cullen? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I strain to think of a situation where we ever uh, needed or thought we needed to look at a, a file of, uh, of someone who, uh, whose background check had been done during a prior administration uh, without that person's uh, uh, express written consent and, and really the only time we would have liked to have done it uh, frankly was in uh, when we were building a short list for Supreme Court nominations we had a number of sitting federal judges uh, that were on our short list we didn't uh, we, we didn't uh, we would have preferred not to have had to have gone to those judges and get their consent uh, just because of leaks, and uh, we were trying to, uh, to fill uh, Justice Powell's seat under, uh, under a magnifying glass, but ultimately concluded, after consulting with the Justice Department and the FBI, that we had to go get Judge Kennedy's consent. So that is, uh, you know, in, 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 in our culture, the culture that, that, uh, that we grew up in and that Dick Hauser uh, helped develop, uh, you never, ever requested that information without the, the knowledge and consent of the individual uh, involved. Thank you. Mr. Kovacs, you referred to the standard form 86 and, and noted the very sensitive information that requested your military history, if you have any mental problems, if you have drug problems, drinking problems, et cetera. I mean, it's a very long thing, and I would ask you, I'm consent that this form would be made a part of the record at this, this time. But it's very sensitive information. And according to the information also on the form, uh, the questionnaire is for sensitive positions. We've been conducting background checks using this form for over 50 years. But on the form, it states, the information you give us is for official use only. We will protect it from unauthorized disclosure. Authorized disclosures include the Privacy Act routine uses shown on this form. What would you define as an official use? I mean, isn't that uh, pretty much of a guarantee to the to the person who's filling this out, that it is going to be very, very tightly uh, controlled and not being released to, you know, unauthorized people. Yes, sir. Uh, as, as indicated in my opening statement, other than Jane Denenauer, there were only 
two lawyers in, in, uh, in my office, other than me, who were authorized to look at the forms. One of those only looked at, at judicial forms, and that's because that's a fairly convoluted process uh, with, a, with a lot of burden. And, and the other person was my deputy and, and me, and no one else did. We had, we had 12 lawyers on my staff, and none of them looked at FBI forms. It was, it was a, a matter of, of, uh, of supreme uh, sensitivity, and lots of people uh, uh, are rightfully uh, concerned about who's going to see uh, their FBI files. Thank you. My time has expired, and I would now turn to the gentlelady from Illinois, Mrs. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, before I begin answering, okay. asking my question, I'd like to, to uh, make the committee aware that the White House Chief of Staff, Leon Panetta, and Counsel of the President, Jock Quinn, have just announced that a new senior security officer will now be directing personnel Thank security you. matters for the White House. And his name is Chuck Easley, who is now um, head of security for the executive office of the President. He served a total of 20 years in the United States Army, and he is a uh, wide and distinguished background in security matters and will bring very needed expertise and experience to the important duties of the office. And now I'm going to ask my questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Ms. Gimmel, uh, you've had a long and distinguished career at the White House beginning with the Nixon administration. No, beginning with the Johnson administration, I believe you said. Johnson administration at Department of the Treasury, Nixon administration at the White House, yes ma'am. And you've served in the Special Projects Office, the Appointments and Scheduling Office, and from 1981 until your retirement in August of 93 in the Office of Personnel Security. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, did you train the employees of the office on its standard operating procedures before you retired in 1993? Uh, yes, ma yes, ma'am. That was in process. Okay. That was in process? In process. Yes, ma'am. So that means that some had been trained or, so, or what? The staff still, for instance, uh, the detailee that has been referenced still was not on board. So there's still going to be staff changes made. It was not a firm staff at that point. At the point when you left? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We know now that the Clinton administration requests the FBI security files of individuals from the Bush White House. And based on your experience, how do you believe this might have happened? I can only say that now having been removed from that office for almost three years and having to look from the outside in, I can only speculate that a follow-up procedure which would have been to request the Secret Service to provide a final list, a second list, was never made. And. Uh if it, was, if, it, if it were never made, then what implications would be there? They basic, basically, the Secret Service list was used as the primary source, not the only source, but the primary source. If a follow-up list had never been requested from them, basically, a cross-reference check would have been almost impossible to make. Were you uh, regularly involved in updating the security files of the career White House employees beginning um, with the um, with these administration with the Reagan administration? Yes, ma'am, I was. And did you rely on lists of names provided by the Secret Service for your primary source of these updates? We always heavily relied on the Secret Service, not only for current information, but for accurate information. And certainly, to the best of my knowledge, nothing like this has ever happened before. Well, did you inform others in the office to request that an additional list from the Secret Service would be needed for these updates? Yes, ma'am. It was very much understood that the initial list the office had was just that, an initial list to be used to start the first steps of the update project. It was very well known that many personnel decisions had yet to be made and therefore that follow-up would have to be done. Okay. Do you recall if the list provided by the Secret Service would have had an A for active or an I for inactive next to their names, to the names? No, ma'am, I do not recall. Well, when you requested copies of security files from the FBI, you filled in a standard form with the White House's name printed on the top. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but I guess it looks something like this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, 
did any of your superiors review these form requests before you gave them to the FBI? Not when we were requesting a previous background report, no, ma'am. So during, but so then during the regular update project, uh, projects in which you were involved, how often would you request a list of names from the Secret Service? Basically only twice, ma'am, at the beginning to initiate the process and then the second cut to be used as the final cut. Okay, and, and you would do that for any, any particular offices or for high turnover offices or what? Is that the reason why you requested the second one? Yes, ma'am, exactly. Did you leave behind any Secret Service uh, list of names that you had requested for the update project when you left in August of 1993? The list that was received from the Secret Service was left behind. It was still in process, far from being completed, correct. Mr. Cobblehouse, um, according to the FBI, since the late 1950s, the White House has routinely requested background investigations and checks to determine the suitability of applicants for federal employment or the wisdom of allowing particular individuals to gain access to the president. All that was required in order for the White House to gain access to these background checks was a simple form with the name of the White House counsel typed on the on the top, similar to this one, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's my understanding that these pre-printed forms were also used while you were in the White House, is that, uh, while you were the White House counsel, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, when you were the White House counsel, these forms had your name on them, is that right? That's correct. Okay. But it, it's my understanding that you did not actually sign these request forms, is that true? I did not actually sign the forms, that's true. Okay. How many people had access to these requests, uh, these, these uh, forms? That's, uh, I think the forms resided only in uh, Jane Denenauer's office, and uh, that office would be the only office that would have the forms. Okay. Now, so did you, did you personally review all of the request forms before they were sent to the FBI? Did I? Yes. Uh, no, ma'am. As I uh, testified in my uh, testimony, I, uh, my office at very senior levels would have reviewed, would have approved putting the people into the clearance, the making of the request forms for all nominees, all appointees, all senior White House positions. The, the one category that uh, my office at senior levels would not have been aware of would be more junior positions at the White House, secretaries or whatever, where uh, the retention or the hiring of that individual had been approved by uh, uh, the, office, the head of the office administration or the head of presidential personnel, and uh, we, we, uh, that person would be put into clearance uh, uh, upon that authority. Uh, with Jane Denenauer sending uh, the, per the person's name in, and then when the feedback would come back from the Bureau, that, that uh, the FBI file would be reviewed from my office to make sure that person was uh, an appropriate person to have a pass. So you would personally know... I'm sorry to say the gentlelady's time has expired. Oh, Mr. Chairman. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at the large array of members that are here to ask questions, I'm going to have to hold very strictly to the five-minute rule. Now, I recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have my complete uh, statement uh, submitted for the record. Without objections, order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me make three quick points before I ask some questions. First of all, the misuse of FBI files is not an isolated incident. In 1993, the Clinton political appointees at the State Department retrieved the personnel files of 160 political appointees who served during the Bush administration. They went on to leak to the press sensitive information on at least two of these people from their files, Elizabeth Tamposi and Jennifer Fitzgerald, and this was a horrible abuse of these people's right to privacy, so I wanted to point that out. Second, I'd like to restate what Louis Free said, the head of the FBI, because I think it bears repeating. He said the prior system of providing files to the White House relied on good faith and honor. Unfortunately, the FBI and I were victimized. Now, this is a Clinton appointee saying this. I promise the American people that it will not happen again on my watch. I think that's a very vivid statement, and, uh, and I'm happy that uh, Mr. Free was uh, honorable enough to make that. The last thing I'd like to point out is that on June the 8th, in an article in the Washington Post, Mr. Marsica said he read the files and notified Mr. Livingstone if they contained derogatory information. Now, Mr. Uh, Culverhouse, 
indicated that uh, every single one of these forms had a list of questions and at the end was a question, is there anything else you should tell us that might uh, cause embarrassment to the White House or cause some problems? And this would have constituted a derogatory information that was very confidential. I, I'm correct in that. Yes, sir. Uh, can you ever recall anybody giving that kind of information to uh, other people at the White House that was uh, not properly cleared, or was that ever disseminated to other White House personnel when you were there? No, sir. That was the hardest part, uh, Congressman Burton, of our job in the clearance process is, is explaining to uh, the chief of staff, uh, sometimes the president himself, uh, the uh, the office, the, the director of the Office of Legislative Affairs, if the individual had uh, congressional uh, patronage, uh, uh, or the uh, the Office of Presidential Personnel, that. For reasons we can't tell you, we are not going to clear that individual. That individual will never be nominated by the but president. But you wouldn't yesterday. publicize that in any way? No, sir. Okay, let, let me ask you this. As I understand it, there were over 408 requests made of people from previous administrations over Mr. Nussbaum's, not his signature, but his, his name typed in on a form. Uh, can you ever recall any of you, any administration, uh, requesting 50, 100, 200, or 408 records of previous employees from previous administrations? Not me, Mr. Burton. Uh, I re as I said in my opening statement, I recall of no um, report for anybody from a prior administration unless it was in connection with employment by President Reagan. To a, another post like the Supreme Court? Would be well. There were there are many positions on uh, some of your independent agencies that require Democrat appointments, so there may be somebody in that connection. But never uh, unless it was uh, involving another potential appointment by that's, that current administration. That, that's correct. That's correct. Would you say that 408 requests from previous administrations with no prospect of additional employment within the current administration would be out of line? Well, I, I think it's it's extraordinary. I mean, they have 400 prior. Prior employees of the White House, uh, uh, going from A to G, that would suppose there were probably, if you were do your arithmetic, a thousand Bush appointees there. It's just it's inconceivable. Mr. Marsika said in this uh, newspaper interview that he notified Mr. Livingstone on these 408 files if there was any derogatory information. Would any of you think that was in line, or would you think that was out of line? Well, but. The job uh, required uh, assessing derogatory information, but the review of these 408 files served no apparent purpose. They weren't being appointed to anything. And if you didn't update those files, some of them were five, six, seven years old, if you didn't update those files with a name check or fuller investigation by the FBI, F FBI as I said in my earlier testimony, those files were otherwise useless. They served no they serve no purpose. Well, no, those since, people since were, they, since were going they to go served, nowhere. Pardon, pardon me for interrupting. Since they served no useful purpose, then one, I would think, could only deduct that they were going to be used for political purposes or for some other purpose that was not consistent with good government. Anybody have any comments on that? Or is that a deduction that I alone can make? All I can say is, is that there being no legitimate purpose, you have to wonder what the, what, what, what the real purpose Okay. Was uh, why anybody would have continued reading these uh, these files after they got past James A. Baker the third. Why anyone would continue to read is a mystery to me. Uh, Congressman Burton, uh, Judge Free has already said that the file should not have been there. Uh, that it was a gross invasion of privacy. Uh, there was no appropriate reason for the files to be there. So a review for derogatory information or even for positive information was inappropriate in my view. The files should not have been there, and they should not have been reviewed. Period. Let me ask one final question. Ms. Dannenauer said that only employees currently working at the White House under her watch were, uh, were uh, uh, scrutinized with this kind of information. Only current employees. Is that right, when you were there, all the time you were there? You mean, are you still talking about the, uh, the, the great numbers of 400? What you, uh, oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. Yep. My question is, people who were <clears throat> uh, prospective employees or currently working at the White House were the only ones that you recall that you asked for this kind of information? Oh, absolutely. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gray, Mr. Culverhouse, and Mr. Hauser, is it accurate to say that you did not review every request that went from the personnel office to the FBI for security information? Mr. Hauser? Uh, is it, does anybody disagree with that statement? You didn't, you didn't, you gentlemen didn't review every, every request. Isn't that accurate? Uh, that would be, be true, but you have to, again, as Mr. Bo uh, Mr. Gray and Mr. Culverhouse indicated, uh, in many instances, in most instances, the requests were, were triggered by the Form 86 or the consent of the individual being done. I think the only category uh, where that may not have been done was to seek the prior completed background investigation of a For whatever employee. reason the request was being made, you, you gentlemen didn't review each request that was sent to the FBI That's and you didn't get access to it unless there was a problem that was found at a lower level. Isn't that correct, that Mr. Hansen? That generally correct. Okay. Now, Ms. Gamble, you, you testified that uh, uh, you would get lists from the uh, security office, Secret Service office, rather, and, and you would send those names on to um, the FBI. Isn't that accurate? Uh, yes, sir. After, of course, several other steps, but yes, sir. But that was generally the process. Yes, sir. Okay. When um, We've had a 16-year period when the Republicans have been in office, and most of these men who were counseled to the president were counseled to a president who succeeded a, a previous Republican president. It was Reagan, Bush, and then... Uh, so they were there during that, th those uh, three terms. When Mr. Reagan came into office in 1980, there was a transition from a Democrat to Republican. Do you recall whether all of the files uh, at that time um, on uh, people working in the, in the administration were handed over to the new administration? Uh, the same process was used, uh, but certainly this problem never serviced. As I said before, this is the first time this has ever occurred, to my knowledge. Yes, sir. Well, the, the, the White House, Clinton White House, claims that the Bush White House cleaned out all the personnel security files of all White House employees and others with access. Was that done by the, uh, the Carter administration before the Reagan administration took over? Yes, sir, it was. There would have been no files there. So they had to start all over again that is to correct. compile yes, these sir. lists. Yes, and sir. at that time, did they have to then send in for the people who were held over? Absolutely, uh, yes, sir. And where would they get the names to send to the FBI of all the holdovers? Again, sir, we used the Secret Service list to rely upon. So what, what we have here is a new administration taking over a, after 16 years of Republican rule, and we have uh, uh, wish 12 it years. Yes, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> you wished it were 16, and you're trying hard now <laughs> for partisan purposes to accomplish that goal. But the fact of the matter is, after 12 years, uh, th this new administration came in with people who were not uh, all that familiar with the processes. Ms. Gemmell, did the Clinton administration ask you to stay on to help them out with this uh, activity? I was extended, sir, on one occasion, yes. My first departure date, if I recall correctly, was to have been, I believe, around June the 8th. Mm -hmm. They did extend me then until August the 13th, yes, sir. And uh, did they ask you to stay on beyond that? No, sir, they did not. Now, um, Mr. Mart. Sheikha says in his uh, explanation that um, he, um, he was trying to update all these files and um, he took the information from the Secret Service. I mean, it, at best I can tell, he just had too many names that didn't make any sense for him to request information about. Isn't that right? He just had a long list, and it, it, nobody can understand why he had such a long list, including people from the old administration. Again, sir, trying to look from the outside in now, yeah. I do believe that there was a serious, very serious problem of no name recognition by the individuals working on that list. Yes, sir. Individuals working on the list at, at, before it went over to the FBI? Yes, sir. Okay. Does anybody here have any information to give us other than speculation that the information, once it was received from the FBI, was treated in a way that breached confidentiality? Anybody know that firsthand? 
Oh, I gather, I gather, Mr. Gray, do you ask Well, I, I think that our testimony has, has, has indicated that we did not have detailees from outside of the... No, no, the that's my, my question is, do you know of your own knowledge that once they got all these long lists of names that probably were not appropriate to ask for the summaries of the FBI files, that anybody got access to that that shouldn't have? Well, I would argue that, that Mr. Marsica shouldn't have had access to those files and shouldn't have read through them. That's what I would argue. I mean, well, I would, Mr. You had... Mr. Marsica was assigned, detailed over. Now, maybe that was uh, different than what previous administrations. Yeah, if you're of asking, you know do that. I know whether he, in turn, gave that information to anybody else? Are you speculating this no, might have been done for political purposes or some nefarious goal? I, I, it's more I, I, likely I, I, than not. It was just done because they had a, a wrong list, and they didn't think through whether they needed to request that information. But no one has, has to my knowledge, has, has indicated that there was uh, inappropriate treatment of the list. In fact, Mr. Marcheka says that um, it was, wasn't his job uh, to determine who should or should not have been on the Secret Service White House access list. He wasn't to make that judgment, so he got the list from others. And then he said there were only three files that he reviewed in the course of the update project that he delivered to Mr. Livingstone's. Re Mr. Otherwise, Waxman, these have, all stayed in some... Mr. Mr. Waxman, I, I, I was on that list. He presumably reviewed my file. I did not consent to him, Mr. Livingstone, or anyone else at the Clinton White House reviewing my file. It was inappropriate, and when, he when should, you, shouldn't um, have been there, and he shouldn't have done it. When you had a list, of, and you, uh, when you were uh, in charge of this, did you know that everybody had agreed to have their files reviewed? Or weren't so those people, are the only files we reviewed. By, some uh, people were being reviewed to see if they were going to be appointed. Gentlemen's not that they time. Were. Gentlemen's time has They expired. always consented to that, Mr. Waxman, always. M may I add something, Mr. How's Chairman? The distinction here, Mr. Waxman, is we're dealing with current employees versus prior employees. Current employees have an expectation that their file is going to be resident at the White House and that it will be updated in due course. The people who are on that list were not current employees. It could have been easily verified, as Ms. Dannenauer had done for the years, or, or Ms. Gimmel had done. And, and the notion that, uh, that they were cleaned out, there is something called the Presidential Records Act, and files leave. This is traditional from administration to administration and that these category of files were of a lower priority because the people who were employed at the White House in a holdover position had current permanent passes. There was not a concern for them. Uh, the Secret Service was aware of who they are, had copies uh, and of their files, and had passed on them as well. So I think there's a, a qualitative difference here between uh, current and former employees and their respective files. Gentleman's time has expired. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman, and ask him if he might yield <coughs> for one question. Be pleased to yield the gentleman. Just to establish, uh, Ms. Gemmel, that you did leave the White House in August of 1993, I, I believe. August 13, yes, sir. And so you were not there at the time of these, this uh, spiking of requests for uh, documents for FBI files that mm. took place in December of 93 through January of 94. No, sir, I was not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what we have before us today is not partisanship, it's just bad practice and bad procedure. In October of 92, Vice President Gore, then a member of the Senate, stated in very strong reaction to President Bush's freedom of information, request for information about Mr. Clinton, and I quote, this is an abuse of power unprecedented to my knowledge in the midst of a political campaign to have the President of the United States ordering tax dollars to be used in an official search for information of a personal nature in all of the government files about a political opponent. And now, Mr. Chairman, here we are holding hearings on the very actions the Vice President condemned just some four years ago, except this time it concerns the files of some 481 private citizens. And I might add, Mr. Chairman, these are only the files that we know about. We've also been requesting the administration for some 2,000 pages of documents on uh, and uh, based on an executive privilege claim, they're being withheld, which I believe is constitutionally questionable, and against the precedents established by presidents going back to the Kennedy administration. At every turn in this affair, the Clinton administration has attempted to downplay its significance. In fact, George Stenopoulos, one of the president's close advisors, said the committee on June 8th and I quote, instead of making these charges, they should be apologizing for their original false charge.
Let's not make any mistake that this hearing is about far more than streamlining procedures for record keeping. As the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation declared about this issue on June 15th, and I quote, the prior system of providing files relied on faith and honor. Unfortunately, the FBI and I were victimized, close quote. This country doesn't need any more Watergates. It doesn't need another constitutional crisis. Obstruction of justice, contempt of Congress, violations of the Federal Privacy Act, misuse of the Federal Bureau of Investigation are all very serious charges. But so is an abuse of the faith and honor that not only the FBI, but the American people must necessarily entrust to the President and to the White House. It is our hope and concern, Mr. Chairman, that the Clinton administration will change in attitude and demeanor and begin to help this committee complete this important investigation of the travel office firings and will maintain the integrity of the security system of the FBI files. I would like to ask Ms. Gemmell, who was your superior when you were in office, Ms. Gemmell? With the Clinton administration, yes. sir? It would have been Mr. Livingstone. And before that? And before that, it would have been Ms. Dannenhauer. And Mrs. Dannenhauer, uh, let me ask you, Describe what files, if any, remain in the Office of Personnel Security after an administration ends up its uh, term. Well, first of all, uh, the, name of, the correct name of our office always was White House Security. It was not Personnel Security because we also handled the, the presidential. Uh, it was only during the, the new administration where they separated it out, apparently, and change the name to White House Personnel Security. And what files remain in that office? No files. End? No, sir. Have you ever assisted a new administration after a political party change in the White House as in the Bush-Clinton changeover? Yes, sir. And what training did you provide to the new administration? Well, I would sit down with, with the attorneys in each case or in each new administration and explain to them what we had and what we were doing there. And um, uh, it, was, it was quite uh, sometimes lengthy, but, but we tried to explain without getting into the, the, all the, the uh, how long, minutia. How long did you remain uh, when the administration changed over? Well, which administration, sir? To this administration? In the Carter administration. Carter administration was two and a half months. It was till April 1, because and they did not have a director. When the Clinton administration came into the White House, did you meet with Craig Livingston? Yes, I did eventually, yes. He came in, but initially I met with about four, possibly five attorneys and showed them exactly what, we, uh, what our office was uh, functioning with. And so uh, eventually it was Mr. Kennedy. He was not there in the very beginning. I believe he came maybe um, three weeks later. I'm, I'm not sure of the date. But in the very beginning, I, there were two attorneys that I discussed it with, and then maybe two or three more. And um, none of those people were, of course, over that office. And Ms. Denauer, did any of the former counsel think that, uh, or advise you that the documents showing the White House request for Billy Dale's FBI records should have been subject to executive privilege? No, sir. Um, Yes, could I uh, address that to the former counsel who are here? Did any of them, did any of the counsel advise Ms. Danahauer that the, that a request would be subject to uh, uh, executive privilege? I don't think I would have, but the question never came up. It's sort of a hypothetical. Uh, I don't think this material is privileged, but it never came up in the Bush administration. Can I ask the other counsel? Uh, same answer for me, sir. Would, would the gentleman yield just, uh, just to yield. clarify that, if I may? The, the, this whole thing began to develop because of a one of those slips that we referred to over Mr. Nussbaum's request uh, was indicated uh, that uh, for Billy Ray Dale, and that was originally a claim of executive privilege. Would, do you think that was a legitimate claim of executive privilege? I would for say that definitely document? not legitimate. <laughs> I, I agree with that, Mr. Chairman. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Now please recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos, for five Thank minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to commend you for holding these hearings. It was observed last week that in this town every snowfall is a blizzard and every event is historic. And if you look at the paraphernalia, it seems like a historic event, but of course it 
clearly is just an attempt at a political smear of the White House. I must admit I'm appalled if my friend will stay from New York. I was appalled to hear my friend from New York draw an analogy of an attempt to dig up dirt in a presidential campaign on one of two candidates and the stupid mistake obtaining existing FBI files on some 400 bureaucrats of one type or another. None of these people was running for president, Mr. Gilman. This was not a presidential campaign. When the Bush administration tried to get the dirt on Mr. Clinton, that was an attempt to interfere with the presidential election. This was an inexcusable, stupid mistake which we all condemn. Now let me move on. No, I will not yield. I only have five minutes. Uh, let me move on to another issue that Mr. Culverhouse mentioned, which I think is rather interesting. You understandably are irritated, as I would be irritated, if some clerk at the White House got my FBI file for no reason whatever. I sympathize with you and empathize with you. But isn't it true that in conducting the FBI investigation of you, you initially gave your consent, didn't you? That As everybody else did. Yes, that is correct. So, so, you know, you provided your consent for an FBI investigation. This stupid request should never have been made. They should never have gotten your file, and you are absolutely correct. But these were not files which were obtained without consent. Your file was obtained with your prior consent. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Lantos, let me just there... finish because I don't have time. I haven't asked the question. Did we let the witness I'm using my consent? five minutes anyway I can ask unanimous consent. We don't take that out of time and allow the witness to answer. I well, if, if the, if the, if the, the, if the member asks the, the uh, witness a question, I think the witness should be permitted to answer. I asked the question, Mr. Answer. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, let, me, let me sort of try to establish where we are. We all agree that privacy is paramount. We all agree that this procedure by uh, the two people in the office was stupid, inexcusable, unacceptable, and they probably should both be fired, and I hope they will. But the fact remains that just as Mr. Bush was never personally involved in requesting FBI files. Mr. Clinton was not involved in requesting your file or anybody else's file. We now have instituted the tightest procedures in American history, so this idiotic mistake will never again take place. The President apologized, Leon Panetta apologized, and what we have now is an attempt to drag out a political smear because the Dole campaign is not getting off the ground. That's what we are dealing with. And it's important for the American people to know what we are dealing with. I, have a, I do have a question of Mr. Culverhouse. Has there been any damage come to you except for the psychological damage for this individual having requested your file and presumably read it? Have you incurred any, any negative consequence? other than the fact that it should never have happened. Well, wait, wait, I mean, that, 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 that in alone is considerable. I, I think uh, what this tells me... But it's for a the simple the question, Mr. Culverhouse. Has any negative event happened to you as a result of this stupid bureaucratic mistake? And if so, tell me what it was. The fact is that now my file, without my consent, has been reviewed by a clear political operative. We all operative. know that. And the, 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 ne the next time that I, that I think about going into government, I have to worry about he will be the first person that the press will call, uh, and, and that, that is considerable. But and thus far, nothing happened, nothing negative happened to you. Is that true? Other than the fact that an individual has reviewed my file without my consent, no. Okay. Has anything happened to Jim Baker, our former Secretary of State? Anything negative? Has anything hap negative happened to any of the 408? other than it shouldn't have happened. We all agree with that. But to build this up into a, 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 a criminal case, nu nuclear war, is just an absurdity. Uh, I have uh, one uh, uh, final observation, uh, since I still have time, surprisingly. Um, I want to read for the record Craig Livingston's affidavit, which says, 
D. Craig Livingston hereby declares, I make this declaration based on personal knowledge, I was never asked to obtain, I never instructed anyone to obtain, I never sought myself to obtain, and I never disseminated or asked anyone else to disseminate any information I learned from any FBI background files on any person for any improper purpose whatsoever. I declare under penalty of perjury, under penalty of perjury, that the foregoing is true and correct to the best of my knowledge, signed and dated. What we are dealing with is a stupid, idiotic, bureaucratic mistake. These people are now on leave. I hope they will be fired. New procedures are in place, and we are trying to resuscitate a gasping dole presidential campaign. That's what we are dealing with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his views. Um, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> yes, Mr. Hauser. May I respond? Uh, I, I think it was a question that Mr. Lantos did ask of Mr. Mr. Culverhouse. Well, we're, we're still on. There was no question asked. Of this. There, there was a question about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, excuse me. There was no question asked of this gentleman. Well, we have. The witness. He is responding to a question that was it's raised. It's a hearing, not an inquisition, Mr. Chairman. Let's hear the question. What was the question, Mr. Chairman? Let's debate the point, Mr. Chairman, rather than answer a question. The gentleman. All right, we will. We will. We have many members here waiting to ask questions. We will refer to the gentlelady from uh, Maryland for five minutes, and perhaps she would permit Mr. Hauser to make Begin a comment. I'm just going to say that beginning, uh, beginning my five minutes, I will uh, defer to Mr. Hauser to respond to the question. The, or Mr. Culverhouse. The, the, the point that I was going to make was this, that Mr. Culverhouse, uh, Mr. Lantos, did not consent to his file. There's some noise coming from the other side. The question again was, uh, the question again was along, the, along the lines of no harm, no foul, and that Mr. Culverhouse, you had consented to the background report. Mr. Culverhouse had consented to a background report in connection with his appointment as counsel to the president for the Bush administration. He never consented to his file being in the Clinton administration for any purpose. And there is no justification by which that file could have been obtained. The, point I was making the gentleman is out of order. The, the gentleman is out of order. The gentleman, the gentleman is out of order. The time belongs to the gentlelady from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to uh, continue with my time, or shall we wait till we vote and come back? I, I think it might be appropriate. I think it might be appropriate at this time. The committee will recess. Oh, wait. I think wait. we're going to have a series of votes. So in view of the fact that we're going to have a series of votes, I would like to go until second bells. So if the gentleman will proceed. Well, continue now, then. Right. I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this critical hearing today. I, I think the American public deserve to know the policy, procedure, and privacy issues. These are all very important to all of us. And I want to point out, uh, that this investigation began in July of 1993 when uh, the chairman first sent a letter regarding the circumstances surrounding the firings of seven White House travel office employees. The document that triggered the release of the FBI file list was only discovered when the 1,000 pages that were produced by the White House the day that the House was scheduled to vote on the contempt resolution um, that they arrived. Contained in those 1,000 pages was a memo from former White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum to the FBI requesting confidential FBI reports on Billy Dale, who had been fired seven months before. We now know that Billy Dale's file was among those uh, 400 confidential FBI files requested by the White House, uh, predominantly comprised of former uh, Reagan and Bush appointees and some who had not worked in the White House for over a decade. Incidentally, with Jim Baker's name there, we know that he may have run for the president, uh, presidency. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this committee, I believe, firmly has the responsibility to raise some critically important questions. And in the words of the FBI, uh, the White House requests for the 481 FBI folders were, quote, without justification and served no official purpose. And so we must determine why the files were requested, what was done with them, and why longtime political operatives were in positions that allowed them to have access to and to hold on to such sensitive information. Ultimately, we must answer the question, was it a result of gross and inept mismanagement, as has been suggested, or something that had another underlying uh, rationale that was more sinister? 
So today's hearing is important to lay the groundwork, the background in terms of how things had been done in previous administrations so we can compare them with what has been done with this uh, um, egregious uh, uh, behavior. Our witnesses, uh, in sharing their experiences, they're very profitable because they give us, uh, uh, tell us about how they received and uh, secured confidential FBI background files with access lists and, uh, and all of the other. Um, once we understand all of this, we can then compare and contrast the actions of the administration in the hopes of also co uh, correcting it in the future and trying to redress the, uh, the problems that have occurred because of this. I think a, a frightening uh, breach of privacy has occurred. More than 400 citizens, some of whom are my constituents, I have looked through that list, have been victimized. This is a critically important step en route to discovering the truth. And I'd like to address a few questions uh, to some of the panelists. For instance, uh, Ms. Dannenhauer, did you allow volunteers or interns to work in um, the White House Office of Personnel Security to help prepare the forms to order background files? No, ma'am, we did not. Why, why didn't you? Because they were not cleared. We had to have everyone in that, in that office had to have a full background investigation by the FBI. Mm -hmm. Now, we did have details from other offices within the White House, but they, we had to verify that they had full background investigations. Right. So this leads me then to a question for Ms. Gimmel. Did interns work in this office during the Clinton administration? Yes, ma'am. There were both students and volunteers. Did they, um, did they work in the vault ever? Uh, yes, ma'am, they did. Did they have clearances, if you know? No, ma'am. They would not have had completed full field background investigations. Mm. How old were they? Extremely young, ma'am. I would say... To me, everybody is young, but... I, mean, <laughs> I would say to... perhaps between 18 and 20. Between 18 and 20. Mm -hmm. um, I, let me, I, I guess, ask both of the, uh, the women, um, Ms. Dannenhauer and Ms. Gimmel, was uh, Mr. Livingstone working on other things um, such as advance while you were there? You want me to yes, answer uh, maybe I'll ask you. Uh, I, he was not there really a, a very long while I was there. I only worked with him probably um, part time. He would come in, uh, it, maybe be there half a day as far as I can remember. And then he did come in um, ultimately, probably sometime, well, it probably would have been February. So, uh, you, so you, your understanding is he, did not, he didn't work full time? Right. You think you have to work full time at that job? I think might have worked for. I would not know that. No Generally, his time has expired. Right. But you do see it as a full time job. Oh yes, yes. Uh, ma thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now have uh, two votes in, uh, that are pending. I'm going to uh, ask the indulgence of our panelists that uh, will recess the committee for about 15 minutes. I'm not going to take a long break here, uh, so that we may go and vote, and we will return as rapidly as possible. Thank you all for waiting. Thank you. continue our coverage of this hearing on access to FBI files in just a moment. Right now, some programming notes.